Hi, and uh, welcome to this video where I go over my paper, Bagging is an Optimal Pack Learner, uh, which received the Cold 23 Best Paper Award. So in this talk, I'm just going to try to give you both the context of the result and also the main ideas in the proof of this new result. So the setup, just to get started, is we're looking at a supervised learning uh, setup. The idea here is that we'll, I guess we'll focus on just binary classification, where an example problem could be that you get training input images that are either images of cats or croissants. And each of these input images, they have the label, which is either cat or croissant, and the features that describe the image would be, would be the pixels on the image. Now, the goal is to use this training data, right, such that when we get a new picture where we don't have the label, we can predict this label, we can uh, predict whether this is a picture of a cat or a croissant. So given only the features, predict what the label is. And if we want to be a little bit more formal about this, we say typically that this data that we need to make predictions on comes from an input domain X. So X here could be all images of a particular size. And the data also has labels and they come from some output domain Y, which could be, for instance, cats and croissants in this example, or minus one and one are more typical notations for binary classification. Okay. What we're trying to learn here, at least in this idealized and simple setup, is some unknown target function f. So f is a mapping from the input domain to the output domain. And here, let's think of this, this f as the correct mapping of images to cats and croissants. And the training data then with this notation consists of labeled examples, uh, x1 up to xm. So these are the features. They come from the input domain. And then the evaluation of this unknown target function f of xi for each of these training examples. All right, so this is the training data, and the goal then is to produce a hypothesis H, so it's just a function mapping from the input domain to the output domain, and the hope is that this function should be close to this unknown target function so that when we get new examples, we can use this H uh, to predict the label. All right, of course, I still haven't said exactly what we mean by H being close to F, but I'll try to, to get into that. So these are basically the ingredients in this supervised learning setup, right? Again, we have this unknown target function, which could be the correct mapping of images to cats and croissants. We have the training data consisting of these labeled examples. They are fed into a learning algorithm. And the goal of a learning algorithm is typically to uh, search through a hypothesis at H, which I haven't said what is yet, uh, to try and find a hypothesis H that uh, agrees with this unknown target function on the training data as often as possible, right? So that h of xi is equal to f of xi as often as possible. And we can use the training data here to, to check for any given hypothesis, how well does it do on the training data, All right? So of course, we need to say, what do we mean by a hypothesis set? And what do we mean uh, by this output hypothesis looking like the unknown target function f? So I'll try to look at a concrete model for, for both of these. So maybe for the hypothesis at first, we'll just take a concrete example. We could have many different things. So if we're looking at binary classification with labels minus one, one, one example is that the input domain could be R to the D. So every element that we need to make predictions on has D features, each of them being a real value. And for such input, one natural hypothesis set that you can look at, a very simple one, would be the set of all hyperplanes. So for any given hyperplane in D dimensions, uh, you return plus one on one side and minus one on the other side, right? So this is the set of linear models for binary classification. Okay, so that's an example uh, hypothesis set. And now the framework that we'll be using to study uh, supervised learning and particular binary classification is this packed learning framework standing for a probably approximately correct due to valiant from 84. So this framework is going to specify what we mean by H looking like the unknown target function F. It's going to tell us something about uh, new data that we need to make predictions on looking like the training data, which is the only reason why we hope to be able to learn something. And one ingredient in this framework is that uh, there's an input distribution, a data distribution over the input domain. So we call this D. So it's some unknown distribution and learning algorithm does not know what it is. But the point is that we assume that the training data we have available consists of MIID samples from this distribution, right? So each XI is sampled from the distribution and then we see uh, xi and the evaluation f of xi, and these are our training examples, right? So the independent identity distributed samples from D. Okay. Now, what we also assume is that the new data that we need to make predictions on also come from this distribution D, right? So 
Uh, then the goal is to produce a hypothesis so that has a small error as possible, right? So the error now of the hypothesis under the distribution D is defined as the probability over getting a fresh sample from the distribution D. So this is the new data point of mispredicting the label, right? That H of X is not equal to F of X, right? This is the error, and this is what we want to minimize. Okay. So if we go back to this framework here again, what we augmented the picture with is this unknown input distribution D, which generates our uh, M training samples X1 to XM, and also generates the X that we need to make new predictions on. And what we'd really like now is that this hypothesis that we produce has an error under the distribution D as close to zero as possible. Okay, so this is the pack learning setup. Now, pack learning again can be studied under different assumptions. And I think the simplest and maybe easiest to understand is the so-called realizable case. So in the realizable case of pack learning, we are promised that this unknown target function that we're trying to learn is inside this hypothesis at H. Right? So concretely, if our example is again, H being the set of linear models, what we assume is that there is actually uh, a function f, a linear a hyperplane f here, such that everything on one side should be classified as plus one and everything on the other side should be classified as minus one. Right? So we assume that the unknown target is in fact a linear model. Right. So if we're in this realizable setup, uh, what you can conclude is that, well, if I have a training data set S, right, consisting of points and the labels, then it's always possible to find a hypothesis that gets all the labels correct on the training data. Right, so that h of xi is equal to f of xi for all the xi in, in S. And the reason for this is in particular because the unknown target function lies in H. Right, So the algorithm can definitely find a hyperplane that gets all the labels correct. As you can see here, when I switch back and forth, the algorithm might not find the exact h it, uh, f. Right, It might find some other hyperplane that also gets all the training labels correctly. So since they're a little bit different, when you see more data in the future, you might still make mistakes, even though you're perfectly correct on the training data. Okay, now this setup also leads to a very simple and natural learning algorithm called empirical risk minimization. And here, what we do is just a learning algorithm just looks for a hypothesis that gets all the labels correct on the training data. It's a very natural algorithm. Okay, so let's try to say something about the quality of this learning algorithm. So what do we have here? So a very classic result, also dating back to the 80s by Vapnik says that, okay, no matter what the data distribution is, so let me try to pass it, it's a long theorem statement, so let's spend a little bit of time on this. So it says, no matter what the data distribution is for any distribution D, okay, so now we have a, a couple of parameters here. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to argue that the hypothesis H that we produce has a small error under the distribution D. In particular, we'd like to argue that its error is at most epsilon for some parameter epsilon. And then we would like to know how much training data do I need in order to guarantee that the error of this hypothesis I produce is at most epsilon. Okay. So then here is some formula here that says something about how many samples I need. And there's also a few more parameters. There's this epsilon, right, which is the target accuracy. And uh, then there's a delta. So what is delta here? So basically the theorem says that uh, with probability one minus delta, uh, we'll manage to produce a good hypothesis, right? So there's some small chance of failure, which we call delta. And this is this is necessary, right? If you think about like the way we obtain our data is that we get IID samples from this distribution. And intuitively, if we're unlucky, right? We might just get copies of the same data point over and over again, right? And then it's really hard to learn anything, right? So there should be some small chance of failure in this model, right? So this is the delta. So what we're saying here is for any distribution D, if I have one over epsilon times D, and I haven't said what D is yet, log one over epsilon, and then there's this plus log one over delta over epsilon many samples. If I have that many samples, then with probability one minus delta over the training data set, it holds that any single hypothesis H that has all the labels correct on the training data, and this is what it says here, also has a small error, an error of at most epsilon. Right, so basically this is justification for this empirical risk minimization algorithm. It says, well, as long as I have enough data, picking any hypothesis that gets all the training labels correctly results in a hypothesis with error at most epsilon, at least with probability one minus delta over the training data. Right, okay. So, so that's what the theorem statement tells us. 
And uh, I guess there's this one last parameter D here that we haven't set yet what it is yet. This is the so-called VC dimension of the hypothesis set H, right? So this is something that captures how expressive the hypothesis set H is. So I'll just remind you what the VC dimension of a hypothesis set is. I'll do that on the next slide. And maybe I'll just also mention here that uh, this matching lower bound, right? So, so here's some so-called sample complexity of, uh, of you know, empirical risk minimization, just picking a hypothesis that gets all the labels correct. And you can ask yourself, right, can you hope uh, to prove or come up with a uh, better bound on the sample complexity? Maybe you can show that you need even fewer training samples to achieve this. And, and there are lower bounds saying that this is the right sample complexity. And I'll get back to that in, in more details uh, shortly. So maybe first of all, let us just remind ourselves what the VC dimension is. So if I have a hypothesis at H, the VC dimension is the D such that two different things hold. Um, there's a set of D samples, so uh, points from the input domain that can be shattered, and no set of D plus one samples can be shattered. Now, of course, now I haven't said what it means to be shattered, so let's just uh, say that. So if I have D samples, so D points from the input domain, then I say that I'm able to shatter them if all the two to the D possible, possible labelings of them uh, can be realized by some hypothesis in H, right? So it's binary classification, right? So the two to the D different ways of, of labeling uh, these D samples. So let's uh, let's look at an example just to make it concrete. So let's say our input domain is R1. So points have just a single feature and numerical value. And let's say H is the set of all hyperplanes in R1. So just to remember, right, a hyperplane in one dimension is basically just a point on the real line and everything on one side, you say plus one, and everything on the other side, you say minus one. Okay, so first let's see that we can actually shatter two points, right? So let's uh, try to pick two distinct points on the real line. And now we wanna argue that, well, for two such points, we wanna find two points where we can generate all four possible labelings, all the ones shown here. And it's not too hard to convince oneself that indeed this is possible uh, with a, hyperplane in 1D. And you can see here that all four labelings can be generated. Okay, so there definitely exist two, two samples that can be shattered. Uh, let's try to argue now that it's not possible to shatter any three points. So if I have any three points on the line, if I look at the labeling that has red on the two outer points and blue on the innermost point, there's no hyperplane that can generate uh, this labeling, right? So there's no set of three points that can be shattered by hyperplanes in 2D. So, which means by this definition that the VC dimension of hyperplanes in, in R1 is, uh, is two. And in general, it can be shown that the VC dimension of hyperplanes in Rd is D plus one. Okay, good. So back to pack learning in the realizable case, right? So, so basically what this theorem statement again tells us is that the number of samples you need so to guarantee that the error of this hypothesis and for any hypothesis that gets all the labels correct is at most epsilon, with probability one minus delta is, uh, or you have this one over epsilon dependency multiplied on to the sum of D log one over epsilon and log one over delta. Okay, so this is tight. So I just moved the results up and I decided to hide the dependency on delta from, from here on. It's just to have cleaner formulas, right? So the interesting point for this talk is really the dependencies on D and epsilon. So, so I'm gonna hide delta from here on, uh, but just remember there's always, uh, in the, all the theorems we're gonna see, there's always something that says this holds with probability one minus delta over the training data set. And there's always a log one over delta over epsilon dependency in the sample complexity and additive uh, such dependency. So, but we're gonna ignore it for here just to keep the formula simple, right? Okay, and there's a lower bound here saying that this is the right sample complexity. Uh, in particular, this lower bound is saying, so it's implicit actually in multiple works, but the lower bound is really saying that if my learning algorithm outputs a hypothesis from H, like for instance, picking one that gets all the training labels correctly, then uh, to get to, to guarantee that it's errors at most epsilon, you need one or epsilon D log one or epsilon many samples, right? Okay. So it's even more general this lower bound than just uh, any algorithm that picks a hypothesis that gets all the labels correct, uh, need this many samples. It's any algorithm at all that outputs a hypothesis from the hypothesis set H, okay. But the interesting fact is that you can actually get around this lower bound. And I guess I hinted to it a little bit. Right. So, so we, we really promised that the thing that we're trying to learn belongs to this hypothesis at H, right? So we promised that this is a linear model, for instance, what we're trying to learn. 
But even though that's the case, right, uh, I guess a learning algorithm would not necessarily have to output a hypothesis from H itself, right? Maybe it could do something uh, really crazy and somehow output some and make predictions that, that are not really consistent with any linear model. Right? You would think that this would only harm you since you promised that uh, what you're trying to learn is a linear model. Uh, but actually, and this was a big open problem for a very long time, whether or not you could do better if you did something uh, that is, I guess, typically called improper, but something that's not outputting something from H. And this was not until 2016 that this was finally resolved, where Steve Haneke showed the following result, right? For any distribution D, if I have just D over epsilon many samples, it's possible I have a learning algorithm that outputs a hypothesis G, whose error is at most epsilon under the distribution D. Right. So, so really, uh, Steve Haneke managed to shave off a log one or epsilon factor in the number of samples that you need. And here you can actually prove that this is the optimal sample complexity for any learning algorithm, right? No matter what you're outputting, uh, this is the best you can hope for. Okay. So I'll try to now give the main intuition in Hennig's optimal pack learner just at a very high level uh, overview of his approach. Okay. So, so the main procedure or idea in his optimal pack learner is to create subsamples of the training data. Right, so I'll try to go over his procedure for doing so. So let's say you have your input data here. Just put them in some arbitrary order, x1 up to xm with the corresponding labels. Then he has this subsampling procedure. So I'll try to, to say what it does. So, so this recursive procedure down here takes two arguments, a training set S and a set T that we'll get back to. Uh, the idea is that you start by invoking this method with the first argument S being the full training data set and the second argument being the empty set. Okay, so what does it do? So we have a ch check here first, the test is the training data set of size less than four. This is not the case here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna partition the training data into four groups of M over four samples each, right? So the first quarter, the second, the third, and the fourth. And now we have three recursive calls. So let's look at the first recursive call here. So what we can see in this recursive call is that the new training data set, the first argument is only S zero, the first chunk here. The new T is, well, the old T, which was the empty set, together with S2 and S3. So importantly, here we're leaving out S1 uh, from this uh, recursion. Now, if you look at the two other recursive calls, we have a recursive call here where we leave out S2 from T and one here where we leave out S3. Now, so if we look at this first recursive call, what we have is basically in the new recursive call, right, this is the new training data set, this first quarter, and then our T is the last two quarters here leaving out this original S1. Okay, so this is our new recursive call. We're still not in the base case here. Uh, so we're gonna partition S into four groups, S0, S1, S2, S3. We're gonna have another recursive call here with a new training data set is only the first S0 and we leave out S1. So it's gonna look like this. And we are basically adding it to the T, right? So now our T is all of this. And now finally, we're in the base case here. So what we do is we're gonna add this S to T and then we're gonna output this subsample that we created, right? So the subsample now that we produced is this pink subset of training samples. Okay, now this was only one path in the recursion tree. So of course, if we follow the whole recursive procedure, we're gonna get all of these different subsamples. What you can see here, basically the three top level recursive calls where we leave out one of these big chunks. And then for each of these recursive calls, we're gonna do three, three new recursive calls where we leave out a chunk as well. So we create all of these many subsamples of the training data. Okay, so this is what Hennig's procedure does. And it basically leave, leaves out one group of data uh, for each recursive level in this construction. Okay. Now his final pack learning algorithm, the optimal pack learner now, what it does is it just generates all of these subsamples that we've seen here as one up to SK. And now for each and every one of those subsamples, he just looks for a hypothesis that gets all the labels correct on that training data on, on only SI. Particularly here, so you just run empirical risk minimization. And the important thing to note is that when you're doing it, you run your algorithm only on the training data uh, that you have in SI, right? You're, you're not allowed to look at the data that's not given to you, right? You cannot look at the gray samples here. You're only allowed to look at the pink samples. So he runs all, he trains on all these subsamples. And then finally, he combines them. And, and here we say that if the labels are minus one, one, if you sum up all the predictions and take the sign, this is just doing a majority vote amongst 
these hypotheses, right? So that's what you do. You train a hypothesis on every subsample and do a majority vote. Okay. So this is Hennecke's algorithm. So let me also try to give the main idea in the analysis, just the intuition for why would this be helpful, what he's doing here. Okay. So this is only the analysis ideas, right? His, his whole full analysis is quite uh, delicate, right? You have to do a whole inductive argument on this recursive procedure. But let me just try to now, let's look at the very top level of uh, the recursion at the very top of the training data here. So, the, right. So in the first recursive call, right, we leave out as one and we include as two and as three and as zero. So importantly, if we're in the very top, when we do this recursive call, right, this recursive call is going to generate a third of all the final hypotheses, right, that goes into the final majority vote. And importantly, all the hypotheses in this one third, they're going to leave out all of this one, right? They're all going to leave out all of this one. Okay. If you look at the second recursive call here, the interesting point is that all the hypotheses that are output here, all the subsamples that we get here and the hypotheses that we train on them, they will all be trained on all of S1, right? Because we add S1 to T. So they will have included all of S1 in their training data. And the same goes for uh, the third recursive call. All the hypotheses we train here will have included S1 in their training data. Okay. So why is this interesting now? So let's try to again to look at the first recursive call, right? This generates a third of all the hypotheses. So let's try to look at, well, I have this one third of all the hypotheses. Let's try to look at if I only had those and I looked at their majority, right? When would this majority be wrong, right? So let's say that uh, this majority of the first one third often error, then in particular, because S1 here was not used for training, S1 is really like a test set for, for this first one third, right? You can think of it as a left out test data set. Which means that, well, if this one third often error when you take a majority vote amongst them, you're going to see it in S1, right? You're going to see a bunch of, of uh, samples where, where they actually err. Right? So these are the ones indicated by these lightning bolts. These are misclassified points by the majority of the first one third. Now, if you think about it, if I tell you, well, these are the samples, the ones with the lightning bolts, where the majority of the first one third error then really these data points are still IID samples from a distribution, but just from the conditional distribution where I told you that the majority of the first one third error. Okay, so these really are independent samples from this conditional distribution. And I just told you that the first one third error. I mean, because this training data was not used for training this first one third. Now, interestingly, right, all the hypotheses in these two remaining recursive calls, right, they all include all of this one. In particular, they include all the lightning bolts, right? Now, since we're in the realizable case, all these hypotheses will correctly classify all their training data, in particular, also all the lightning bolts, right? So all these two thirds will be correct on these lightning bolts. But these lightning bolts are really examples where the first one third, the majority of the first one third error. Right, so, so the intuition is now that these remaining two thirds are trained on the data where the first one third error. And now what we can do is we can take Vapnik's old classic result that says that, well, any hypothesis that gets all the labels correct on a bunch of samples from a distribution D will have a small error under this distribution. Now, since we have all these lightning bolts and all these two thirds are correct on all of them, we can think of it as these remaining two thirds, well, they have a lot of samples from this conditional distribution. And since they have many samples from it, they will rarely error under this distribution, which what we're really saying is that these two thirds, they rarely err when the first one third is wrong. Right, so, so this is great, right? Because we're saying, oh, well, when the majority of the first one third of the hypotheses error, the remaining two thirds are almost always correct. But if I'm doing a majority vote and two thirds are correct and only a third is wrong, this is really great, right? Because then I'm, the overall majority vote is going to be correct. So basically, the main idea here in Hennig's proof is that these hypotheses, they correct each other's mistakes. And in particular, you leave out some training data in order to see examples where you err so that the others can correct it. That's the main idea here. OK, so without going into details here, uh, basically, Hennig's construction is just showing that if you plug in Vapnik's result here, 
uh, then you can conclude that the final majority has an error of at most and you only do epsilon samples. But this really needs the whole recursive procedure and you do an inductive argument starting at the lowest level of recursion and work your way up, right? This is complicated, but the intuition is, is this one up here. Okay. So, so this is Hennecke's result here, right? Um, if I'm in the realizable case, my unknown target is an H, then with D over epsilon samples, you can get an error of at most epsilon. Right, so I think this is a really beautiful theoretical result. And of course, one can ask, well, did his algorithm have any practical impact then? Well, I guess the short answer is not really. And maybe one reason could be that, well, you're generating actually quite many subsamples. So, so his algorithm is kind of slow. And it's also a little bit complicated. So, so let's try to look at this a little bit more in detail. So again, here's his subsampling procedure. And if we look at it, right, we have three recursive calls. Each of these recursive calls is on a data set of size M over four. So the recursion depth will be log base four of M. And so the total number of subsamples that you output will be three raised to the log base four of M, which is about M to the 0.79. And if you look at it, right, each of these subsamples has size at least half of the training data at the top level of recursion, right? You keep at least two full chunks of the data, right? So the running time over empirical risk minimization blows up by a factor basically m to the 0.79, which is quite a lot, right? And if you have a, a lot of data. So this is maybe one reason for, uh, for maybe this is not used so much in practice. Right, so the starting point of, of, of my work here is really, can we find a simpler approach to get an optimal pack learner? Right, is there a simpler, practical, and optimal pack learning algorithm? And uh, so the main, I guess, observation is that what Hennig is doing is really he's doing a majority vote amongst hypotheses trained on subsamples of the data. And this looks very similar to a very classic heuristic called bagging due to Breiman from 1996. So let me just remind you what is bagging. Oh, so bagging stands for bootstrap aggregation. And the basic idea is just, uh, I have a, a choice T, a hyperparameter T, and then I repeat T times. I sample our data points from my training data with replacement. So I sample M prime data points, M prime could be M, maybe M half, uh, sample them with replacement and call the data set as I. Right, so I just sample them independently with replacement, right? So replacement means I can sample the same one multiple times. And now uh, for each of these subsamples I created SI, I just run, I train a hypothesis HI on SI, and then I finally combine them in the majority vote by taking the sign of the, uh, of the predictions, that the sum of the predictions, right? So, so basically maybe if we visualize it, if this is a training data set that we have, uh, what I do is I roll my dice to, and I just repeatedly sample a point uniformly from my training data set uh, with replacement so I can sample the same point multiple times, just means that I can, it kind of has a larger weight. So I sample a whole training data set, I sample another and I sample another. And then what bagging tells me to do is, well, train a hypothesis on each of these subsamples, right? So maybe I train this hypothesis here, this hypothesis, this hypothesis, and then I finally combine them by doing a majority vote. So I would kind of overlay these three different hypotheses and in each of these regions, there's either a blue majority in this case, right? Here's a blue majority, a blue majority, a red majority, a blue majority, red and red majority, right? So I get this nonlinear uh, classifier by doing a majority vote amongst three linear classifiers in this example here, right? So that's bagging. So if we compare this to Hennecke's, it's very similar in spirit, right? The, the only difference is just that Hennecke has this very structured way of subsampling and bagging is just randomly. So the question that we ask is, is bagging also an optimal pack learner? And it's definitely a simple algorithm. It's simple to construct these subsamples. It's also a practical algorithm, at least if few subsamples suffice, right? If you don't need to do that many subsamples. Okay. And it's a super uh, practical, it's used all the time in practice. In particular, it's like, it's this simple version of random forest and this original uh, paper introducing bagging has 32,000 citations which is definitely only happens for uh, practical papers. Okay. So the main result of my work is that bagging is also an optimal pack learner as the title also suggested. So the full theorem statement is that if for any data distribution D, if I have one or epsilon times the sum of D and 
plus log one over delta many samples from this distribution, then bagging with just log m over delta many subsamples produces with probability one minus delta a hypothesis at g, a hypothesis g whose error is at most epsilon. Right, so uh, so basically this is the optimal sample complexity matching Hanekes algorithm also in the dependency on delta. It's also optimal. Now, when I when I say that with probability one minus delta it produces a good hypothesis, this is uh, with the probability here is both over the input sample s, which it always is, uh, also in Hanekes, and also the subsampling that bagging creates, right? So this is a randomized algorithm, right? So there's also a chance that this randomized algorithm fails. You know, maybe it samples the same subsample every single time and then uh, there's no hope. Okay. So from here on, right, I'm just gonna hide delta again. It was just only to say that the dependency on delta is also optimal and it's only logarithmic in this number of subsamples. So now a little bit cleaner is that we need D or epsilon samples um, from the distribution D. We need to create only log M many subsamples in bagging to produce a hypothesis with error at most epsilon. So comparing them again, right, uh, a really cool feature is that bagging needs only a logarithmic number of subsamples, not M to the 0.79 many subsamples. And they're just random and you just sample independently with replacement. And I think like a really cool and surprising thing is that bagging was actually known for more than 20 years before Hanekes algorithm, right? And like it's it's a super standard algorithm that it, it's, I guess is taught in most machine learning undergraduate courses. It was known, this algorithm was known for a long time and just not this property of it. And maybe let me just say that uh, even though the algorithm was around a long time before, the analysis that we're going to see is going to use Hanekes ideas. So it wouldn't really have been possible to prove this uh, without having had Hanekes algorithm first. Okay. So for the rest now of this presentation, I'm going to, to give the main ideas in the analysis showing that bagging is an optimal pack learner. Okay. And maybe one starting point or a good thing to start with is just to say, why does Hanekes ideas not work directly? Right. So let me try to, to show you this. So the main idea, again, if you remember from Hanekes optimal pack learner is that, oh, well, you leave out this one, uh, this chunk of the data, right? This uh, quarter of the data. And, and then you said, well, you had the majority of the first one third of these uh, hypotheses. They don't use this training data. So you're going to see a bunch of mistakes in here because it acts like a test set. And then the remaining two thirds will train on it and correct those mistakes. Now, in his analysis, right, it's, it's really important that you have this third of all the hypotheses and together, even if you look at all their training data, they leave out a constant fraction of all the training data. This is one here is left out from all of them. Right? That's super important in his analysis. You really need a linear sized subset of the training data to be left out from all of them. And in particular, this linear side training data set must be used by the remaining two thirds. Now, this property does not hold for bagging. And in particular, if I look at a third of all these hypotheses I combine at the end, uh, there will be no large left out sample. And why is this? Like, so in particular, like if I look at any case subsamples uh, in bagging, and I and I um, look at one point here, right? If I look at one training point, really each of these subsamples, right? They will include the point with constant probability. If I sample a linearly sized subset of the data. Right. So they will include the point with constant probability, which means really that the chance that all of these k leave it out because they're independent will be exponentially small in k. Right. So the issue is if I look at some third of all my hypotheses in the final majority vote, like they together will only leave out an exponentially small in t fraction of the samples. Right. So so really there's no left out training data set of a of constant fraction of all the data, right? They only have an exponentially small in T fraction of the data that's left out. And so basically what I'm saying here is that when you do bagging, it's super unlikely to see this, this sample here that's not included in any of the subsamples, right? So this is really why you cannot just try to use this approach, right? You don't have this large joint left out training data set. Okay, so, so what do we do instead, right? So first we can ask ourselves, like, can we really, can we somehow still use the ideas in Hanekes construction? And the answer is yes, uh, but we really need a very non-trivial detour uh, to use it. All right, so, so let's try to, to throw, show you the main ideas in this detour. So just to keep the figures simple, 
I'm going to change bagging a little bit just for visualization to say, okay, let's say bagging, uh, you always subsample precisely half of the data and we do it without replacement instead of with replacement, which means that we don't get duplicates. So it's just to keep the figures simpler. Okay. The proof works for this case, so that it can also be adapted to the full bagging case. Okay. So this is just to make it simpler. Okay. So let's look now just for, for concreteness here at, let's say you have six samples and you're looking at subsamples of size three. Right, so bagging maybe samples these three subsamples here, and you do a majority vote on hypotheses trained on the pink points in each of them. So to analyze this, what we're going to do is we will start by somehow getting rid of the randomness in bagging. Right, we will want to relate the performance of this majority vote to instead of deterministic majority vote. So what do I mean by this? So what we're going to relate it to is we're going to look, okay, let's try to look at what happens if I create all the possible subsamples of size three out of the six data points, right? So there's all of them, right? There's exponentially many here, right? The six choose three of them. So there's exponentially many such subsamples. Let's try to see what happens if I trained on all these exponentially many subsamples and did a majority vote, right? Of course, I would never train this, but what I'm going to do for the sake of analysis is going to try and relate the performance of these two. So the claim is that we we're going to show is that bagging here will be almost as good as the majority vote of all these exponentially many subsamples. And this is quite surprising, right? Because in bagging, we only have a logarithmic number of subsamples, and over here, we have an exponential number of subsamples, right? So how can this be the case? Right, so let's try to see how can this happen. Uh, so the first observation is really, each of these hypotheses that you get from bagging, right? Each of them is really a uniform random hypothesis amongst all the hypotheses combined in this giant majority vote, right? Basically, you can see that, right, the first one appears down here, the second one appears here, and the third one appears here. And in custom bagging, right, what we're doing is we're drawing a random subsample, which is exactly the same as saying, okay, I'm just drawing a random hypothesis from among all these exponentially many ones. Okay. So what we're going to do now is we're going to uh, introduce the notion of margins and see how we can use this together with this observation that uh, the bagging chooses random uh, hypotheses from among all of them. Okay, so what are margins? So here we're going to use this notion of margin theory dating back to, to classic work uh, trying to explain the performance of the Adaboost learning algorithm. So when we have so-called voting classifier, which is a majority vote uh, amongst a bunch of simple classifiers. So here's a majority vote amongst T different classifiers. If I have such a voting classifier, at least in the simple case, we can define the margin of this classifier on a training point X comma Y as the fraction of correct voters. So the ones that get the label correct minus a fraction of incorrect voters on this uh, sample, right? So intuitively, right, if you have large positive margins. It means that basically all your uh, your class of your voters agree, and which in some sense means that you're very confident and certain in your prediction. And on the other hand, if your margin is close to zero, it means that basically half are correct, half are incorrect. And if you have negative margins, right, it means that a majority is incorrect. And this margin is going to be a number between one and minus one, right? You can. So let's uh, let's have a look a little bit closer, right? So this classifier that I've shown here is a also a majority vote amongst three linear classifiers. So for instance, if you have this linear classifier and this and this, uh, the previous image is the majority vote amongst them. So, so we have those. And inside each of these regions right here, there are three blue, here's there's three, two blue and a red, and here there are three red predictions and so on. So if I had a blue point out here, its margin would be one because well, three out of three are correct and zero out of three are wrong. If I had a blue point down here, the margin would be a third, right? Because two thirds are correct, one third is wrong. So a third out here, the margin would be minus a third, right? Because only a third is correct and two thirds are wrong. Okay, so these are the notions of margins. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is we're going to introduce this notion of a, a margin loss or margin error. So we're gonna look at this majority of all the possible subsamples and call it G, right? And then we're gonna define the error under the distribution D with respect to a margin of a third as just the probability over a new data point of having a margin less than one third on this data point, right? So basically this is a stricter requirement than not, like the majority vote is correct if at least half of them are correct, right? 
Here we're saying, okay, and actually you get an error for this G, even if your margin is less than a third, right? This is basically the same as saying, even if less than two thirds of all your hypotheses in the majority vote are, are, are correct, if less than two thirds are correct, you pay an error. Okay. So the claim is uh, that, well, this giant majority vote, right? You only need D over epsilon samples uh, for this giant majority vote to have a margin error of less than epsilon, right? So the probability that the margin is less than a third is at most epsilon. And so this is a little bit stronger uh, then it's a normal claim for, for instance, the backing majority vote. There you just say that with D or epsilon samples, the majority is correct. Here you say with D or epsilon samples, two thirds are correct, except with probability epsilon. Okay. And the claim is that if we can establish this, then that's enough to show that bagging works. So let's see that first. Okay. So let's assume that we can somehow prove that from D over epsilon samples, this giant majority vote, it's only with probability epsilon over the distribution D that we get a point where less than two thirds of all these hypotheses are correct. Now, let's try to look at some X in the input domain where the margin is bigger than a third, right? So this is almost all the points, right? So, so at least two thirds of all these hypotheses are correct. Which basically means, right, if I if I now for each of these exponentially many hypotheses, I look at what is its prediction on this point. Right, one of them is blue. There's some red ones. There's some blue ones. Like at least two thirds of them are blue. Right. So now, what happens with bagging here, right? So bagging is drawing uniformly at each of these hypotheses that you pick in bagging is uniform random amongst all of them. Right. So which means that each of them is just a random sample of all these many hypotheses, which means its prediction is uniform random, is the same as picking uniformly at random amongst these many uh, circles here in the middle. Which means, right, that the expected number of blue samples that you're going to see is at least two thirds, right, it's two thirds T. And the expected number of red ones is at most a third T. Now, because in bagging, all of these subsamples are drawn independently, this is just a standard Shannon bound, right? We expect two thirds to be uh, we expect two, uh, two thirds to be correct. So the probability that we see less than two thirds being correct is exponentially small in t. Right? Just standard Shannon of hefting, right? So so this is really a nice thing is that now we can say well, no matter what the data distribution is, if bagging outputs the voter f, and you use t subsamples, then the error of this voter is basically consists of two terms, right? So basically you have, well, whenever this giant majority, if you have an X where the giant majority here has less than two thirds that are correct, well, then you're just gonna pay in the error. We're just gonna say, we don't know anything here. We'll just make a mistake. Now for any remaining data point, anyone that has a margin of at least a third, meaning that at least two thirds are correct, it's only an exponentially small in T probability that bagging misclassifies it. So, so the final error is at most uh, this first term here, which is at most epsilon, which that we know from the claim. And the remaining one here, if we set T to be log M and M is D over epsilon many samples, then exponentially small in log of D over epsilon, that is basically epsilon over D, right? So it's much less than epsilon. So this final error here is at most epsilon plus epsilon, which means that the error of this bagging majority vote is at most two epsilon, right? So this is, is still... Uh, O of epsilon, right? And with twice as many samples, it becomes less than epsilon, right? So this is really what we want. So, so this claim is enough uh, to establish that bagging uh, actually works. So basically what we need to, to prove is just this last statement, right? This majority vote of everyone, we want to show that with D or epsilon samples, uh, it's margin error is at most epsilon, right? The one third margin error. Okay, so how are we going to do this? The basic idea here is that this is where we're going to reduce to Hanneke's setup, um, where we have these very carefully designed overlaps between the subsamples. Okay. And then we're just going to use Hanneke's proof on all these subsamples. Okay. And all of this is again, just remember, right? This whole giant majority vote is only for the sake of analysis, it's not part of bagging, right? It's just for analysis. Okay. So the main observation is that, okay, over here on the left, we have Hanneke's substructure, right? And over here on the right, we have all the possible subsamples you could ever have. And the important point is that Hanneke's substructure is hiding somewhere over here, right? You can find them. They're, they're contained in all the subsamples. So Hanneke's, uh, Hanneke's substructure is sitting over there. 
And we can just use his analysis on, on those subsamples and if we look at just the hypotheses that we produce from these subsamples, we know that they behave well, right? We can just rerun his analysis. They're gonna have a small error. They're gonna behave optimally. In fact, we can strengthen his analysis a little bit. So his original analysis just shows that the majority vote amongst them uh, is correct, except with probability epsilon. Here we can, we can just, you can just tweak his analysis and show that, well, even something much stronger is true. If we look at uh, the majority vote among these uh, Hanneke substructures, then even the margin error is going to be tiny. It's going to be at most epsilon, right? In particular, we can even have a, even insist on an even larger margin in the third. We can say, okay, the margin has to be five, six, right? So only a 12th, which we get an error if even a 12th of all these hypotheses um, mispredict. You can still show just tweaking Hanneke's analysis that um, in, with just DO or epsilon samples, uh, this margin error with five, six margin is at most epsilon, right? So it's it's even only a 12th of all his hypotheses that err. You can show this. And it's just redoing his analysis uh, a bit more carefully. So nothing special there. Okay. Now, the, the problem is that Hanneke's subsample is only these very few subsamples here, right? Out of exponentially many subsamples. So they're not really going to affect the majority votes amongst everyone significantly, right? So what we have to do now is really that we have to argue that Hanneke's structure is not just sitting here, but it's somewhere hiding everywhere in this giant majority vote. And particularly, we want to show that every single subsample is included in a Hanneke-like structure. Okay, so let's try to I'll try to ex explain what I mean by that. Right, so here is all the possible subsamples. And what we would like to argue informally is to say, well, every subsample here is included in a Hanneke subset. So we want to say somehow, well, these blue subsamples, they are structured exactly like Hanneke's uh, subsampling. These green ones are structured like Hanneke, the red ones are, the yellow ones are, and the purple ones are. Right. Of course, this is not quite true, right? Because they're different, so they don't look like Hanneke's. But, but this is intuitive what we'd like to try and argue, that all of the, that we can partition this giant majority vote into little copies of Hanneke's. Now, if we can do this, uh, then the idea is that, well, from Hanneke's proof, right, we know that all of these subsamples, they almost always have a large margin, right? Giant margin, five, sixth margin. Uh, and since all of them have this all the time, then the, the, the full majority vote amongst everyone must also have large margins almost all the time. That's the main idea. Right? And basically, we'll just use Hanneke's proof on all the subsets. Okay, so let's try to see a little bit more detail what we mean by finding these copies of Hanneke's structure. Right. So just to visualize it, I want to have this much smaller example, right, where we only have six samples in total with subsets of size three, just to make the analysis easier. But let's just pretend that Hanneke's structure looked like this example here and not that, uh, that subsampling that I showed you previously, right? Just, just to visualize it. Right. So, so generally, you should think of these subsamples over here on the left as the ones that Hanneke would produce with his very carefully designed overlap structure. Okay, so as we said before, right, his subsamples, the ones that he's using, they appear somewhere over here in the giant majority of everyone. Right, so in particular, we know that this tiny, tiny subsample, right, it's only m to the 0.79 out of exponentially many uh, subsamples, they behave nicely. In particular, right, the error under the distribution D, even with margin, insisting on a margin of five sixths, would be less than epsilon, right? So, so these, these blue ones here, the probability under the distribution D that more than a 12th of the set of these hypotheses is wrong is less than epsilon. This is we can this we can prove just using Hanneke's analysis. Okay, so now we've handled one subsample here, right? We've covered a tiny portion of all the many subsamples. Now, the main observation now to move from here and to the full covering everything is to say, well, the training data points here, right? They are IID from the distribution D. Right. And so really, if I just started by permuting all the training data and then did Hanneke's subsampling on the permuted data, his analysis will still go through, right? Because the permutation of the data doesn't change that the IID from the distribution D. Right. So this is basically what we're going to do, right? We're going to say, okay, so just to, to visualize it, let's just color them in this original order. This is uh, by different shades of, of, uh, of green. These are the original data points training points, let's try to apply a permutation to these points over here on the left. 
right? So then you permute them. So now they're sitting in some other order than the original input order. And then we're gonna do Hanneke's substructure on this permuted data, right? So we're gonna subsample them like this, which means that, okay, if I look at this subsam these subsamples in the original order, what would it look like, right? As you can see here, the first one basically picks out the, th the three darkest colors of green. So that would be these ones over here. And basically we can see that if I permute them back, I'll get a permutation of Hanneke's way of subsampling. So now it means that, well, if I subsample these data in this way over here as well, it still behaves nicely because we can do Hanneke's analysis on it. And now we can see, well, these subsamples, they also appear here on the, on the right here amongst all of them, right? So you can find them all hiding. And in fact, one of them is actually equal to one that we had before, even though we applied a permutation. So now this dark green subsample here as well, we can use Hanneke's analysis and show, well, in here, the margin error is at most epsilon, even with margins five over six. Okay. So now in particular, we can look at, if we look at any subsample here in Hanneke's in this original input order here, and we look at any subsample over here in the majority vote of everyone, right? What we see is that for any such pair A comma B, uh, there's a fixed number of permutations M that make these two subsamples equal, right? And and this number of permutations, right, doesn't depend on what A and B, uh, which ones they are, right? There's exactly the same number of permutations that map any subset of size three into another subset of size three, right? Uh, where we only look at this overlap pattern, which who are included and who are not included. Right, so, so really for any pair A comma B, right, there's the same number of permutations that map them to each other. So what does this mean? So this really means that we can take now, we can take any possible permutation of the input data. If we permute them according to this permutation, uh, we construct Hanneke's subsampling, then we look at where do they appear, the subsample in the original, uh, in the full list of all possible subsamples. So for every permutation, we can place a permuted copy of Hanneke's subsampling structure somewhere uh, over here. So we can repeatedly do this as I visualized earlier, right? Maybe some of them are disjoint. And this is cheating a little bit because as you saw in the previous picture, they will also overlap, right? Uh, but the important point is because of this symmetry, every single subsample over here on the right is included in equally many Hanneke substructures. Right, it's including exactly the same number of Hanneke substructures. Which means now, if we were to first pick uniformly at random one of these Hanneke copies that we placed, and then from within that copy, we uniformly at random play, choose a subsample among the point M to the 0.79 subsamples, then that subsample, because of the symmetry, would be a uniform random subsample amongst all the subsamples that are out here. Right. So this is just because of symmetry. Okay, so if we pick a uniform random copy of Hanneke's and we pick a uniform random subsample in that copy, then that is a uniform random subsample among all the subsamples. Okay. Now let us try to look at an X in the input domain where the majority vote amongst everyone has a margin of less than a third, right? Our goal, remember, is to show that these X's will have a probability mass of at most epsilon, right? This is the final goal we're trying to, to, to show. So let's try to look at such an X where the margin uh, of this majority vote is, is less than a third, right? So again, recall this, this way we visualize it is that each of these dots just corresponds to the prediction of one of these many hypotheses, these exponentially many hypotheses, right? So, since the margin is less than a third, it means that at least one third is wrong, right? So at least a third of all these hypotheses have to make a red prediction on a blue point. Okay. Now, what does this mean? Well, it means now if I pick the uniform random hypotheses amongst all of them, the chance that I get a red prediction is a third. Okay. But if we combine this with this first observation that if we pick a random Hanneke copy and a random subsample therein, then this is a uniform random uh, subsample amongst all of them. It means that if I pick a random Hanneke copy, the expected fraction of red predictions that the hypothesis in Hanneke's copy is, is making, that expected fraction is at least a third, just by linearity of expectation. Okay. Now, 
what I can do now is I can just basically use Markov inequality, so-called reverse Markov inequality, to show that, well, this means that if I'm looking at this x here, where the ex where for a random Hanneke copy, the expected fraction of red predictions is a third, it will be the case that some constant fraction of all Hanneke copies have at least a 12th fraction red prediction among the hypotheses in there. Otherwise, it's just not possible to have a to get an expectation of a third uh, uh, red fraction. All right, so basically what I'm saying is that if X is such a point in the input domain where a third of all these hypotheses are wrong, then it must be the case that a constant fraction of all the Hanneke copies have at least a 12th fraction red prediction among these M to the point seven nine hypotheses that make up that Hanneke copy. Okay. So, right, a constant fraction of all Hanneke copies have at least a 12th fraction red predictions among these subsamples that are sitting inside Hanneke, this Hanneke copy. But what does that mean? It means that that Hanneke copy actually has a margin of less than five over six on this concrete X, right? So this really means that this Hanneke copy is actually making an error on X if I'm looking at this margin loss, the, where we cannot tolerate a margin of less than five, six. Okay. So, so a constant fraction of all Hanneke copies are making a margin error on this point. Okay. But we already said that every single Hanneke copy, well, uh, at least uh, intuitively, all of these Hanneke copy, copies have a margin error of less than epsilon. Right, and here we claim well. If I have such an x here, a constant fraction of all these Hanneke copies will err. So this really means that any this, the, these x's here, all these x's together, uh, where the margin of g is less than a third, their probability mass can only be order epsilon. Right, it can only be a constant fraction factor bigger, uh, corresponding to this constant fraction of Hanneke copies that that uh, that have a margin error every time. And it can only have a probability mass of order epsilon because a constant fraction of all the Hanneke copies will have a margin error when we get one of these x's. But this is what we wanted to show, right? We wanted to show precisely that this majority vote of everyone has a margin error when the margin is a third of order epsilon. By readjusting constants, this becomes just epsilon. Okay, so that is really uh, the main idea, right? So what we've shown, the whole proof here now, is to show, well, this majority vote of everyone here, if from just D over epsilon samples, uh, it's margin error with margin a third is most epsilon. And then we could say that, well, if I do bagging, I'm basically just getting independent uh, hypotheses from among all of these. And so any point with uh, a margin greater than a third, there's only an exponentially small in T chance that you mispredict its label. And then you also pay uh, for all the points in the input domain where G has a margin of less than a third, but this only has mass epsilon. So setting T to be log M, where M is uh, D over epsilon, uh, this exponentially small in T is basically epsilon over D, so it's something tiny. And the final error is at most two epsilon. Okay. So, so really, this was the description of this result. Bagging is an optimal pack learner. The theorem statement is really with D or epsilon many samples uh, as a training data and only log M many subsamples where M is uh, D or epsilon. Bagging produces a hypothesis with error the most epsilon, right? Bagging is used a lot in practice and uh, the algorithm dates back to 1996, so it's been known for a very long time. And these are really the results that I wanted to show you. So thank you very much for, for listening in.